Hi, and thank you for downloading Device Talks. This is Brian Johnson, and I'm here today with Joe Brennan from Innovative Trauma Care. Joe, I'm talking to you from my office in Boston, and actually it's two years to the day uh, of the Boston Marathon bombing, and what might have been the most effective trauma care situation in modern history. I think that, I think definitely more than 200 people uh, who were receiving massive blood loss injuries, uh, and yet there were zero deaths outside of those immediately uh, killed by the bombings. And we heard a lot in the aftermath of that about tourniquets and how they were lifesavers on that day. But you guys think there's a better way. So tell me a little bit about your product, the IT clamp. Sure. The IT clamp um, has been on the market for several years, and it's designed uh, as a quick and effective way to control blood loss. Mm-hmm. or hemorrhage. So it looks similar to a hair clip, and that's what its the initial design was uh, based around. Uh, our founder, Dennis Phillips, a Canadian trauma surgeon, was in the military, and he spent a good amount of time, obviously, deployed and saw a lot of things and knew there was a better way to stop hemorrhage and uh, came up with this device. And believe me, when you need a tourniquet, you need a tourniquet. There's no other alternative. But there are steps in between um, when you have limb loss and uh, other challenges, other hemorrhage. So our device is quick and easy to put on. I said it looks like a hair clip takes 10 seconds where you're talking minutes for a tourniquet. And it's basically uh, hands-free mechanical direct pressure. Mm -hmm. So if you could just envision putting uh, something over a hemorrhage and it immediately uh, stops the external flow of the hemorrhage and it forms pressure on itself, the blood, and it's just basically a tamponade effect, and uh, the internal pressure stops the bleeding. So it's quick, uh, hands-free, once you apply it, and easy. Right. So this is not a, it's not a replacement for a tourniquet? It's a, 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 is it, tell me a little bit about the, the specific differences in that. Sure. A tourniquet is used on the extremities. Mm-hmm. Our product can be used on the extremities. It can be used in the junctional areas. Uh, and it could also be used on the head and neck. Mm. So tourniquets, just extremities. And like I said, when you have our, – our product does not uh, extend to when you have limb loss okay. or you have uh, a spontaneous amputation. So our device is for smaller bleeds than that. But mm-hmm. uh, So there is an intermediary between you know, just uh, direct pressure with some gauze and then limb loss, and we fall in that area. And we have a brighter – broader spectrum of wounds we can be used on, but it doesn't replace the tourniquet. It's another uh, option to use. And uh, like I said, when you have, like you talked about the the bombing at the Boston Marathon two years ago, there are obviously some some, uh, places where you needed a tourniquet. But this is another device, broader application, quicker and easier to use. Uh, So it doesn't replace the tourniquet, but it's another tool for the, for the responders to use. Got it. So, uh, so are we really talking that the the delta there is gauze and then tourniquet? No, there are some other devices, mm-hmm. but you know we fall in that. You know, basically what we tell uh, EMTs and paramedics when you get to wound, the first thing they do is they grab a handful of gauze and put it over the wound. Right. If it bleeds through that gauze, the IT clamp is a good uh, application as long as it's in one of those areas I described. Mm-hmm. It's not going to work for a trunk or abdominal wound. It'll just keep the blood inside, but it won't pack on itself So, because those are large cavities. Right. So if it bleeds through gauze, then, then this is a great application. But you'd be surprised how often gauze is used. Wow. Uh, until a patient gets to the emergency room. And then there are other sort of blood clotting agents that, that paramedics and uh, medics in the military use as well, right? Yes, there are. Yeah, there's uh, anything from an XSTAT, which is uh, just newly uh, approved by the FDA in the military for small track wounds. There's clotting factors that they put on. There's packing that has clotting factors. So oftentimes if they have a, a, a larger wound or a deeper wound, they'll pack it, meaning they'll put uh, gauze or, or uh, treated gauze into the wound and then um, to help stop the blood flow. Uh, and with our product can be used with that packing to make sure the packing does not come back out and make sure it has a tight seal. Right. And so you said your founder, uh, the founder of the company was in the Canadian military. 
Um, what well, I mean, tell me about sort of the backstory. How was there an aha moment for him? How did you, how did you guys come up with the um, the mechanics of the device? I mean, it, it's in, uh, I'd be interested to find out that sort of backstory if you. Yeah, so our company was founded by uh, two Canadians actually, Dennis Phillips, who was a Canadian trauma surgeon, Ian Atkinson, who was a PhD. Um, and spent a lot of his time working in labs and working on more of the biotech and pharmaceutical side. But they grew up together. So Dennis, like I said, uh, deployed to different hotspots in the world and saw a lot of hemorrhage and thought there might be a better way to treat it. And he came up with the idea, actually, from looking at one of his daughter's hair clips. And uh, like I said, our device looks similar to that. So they started working on this just about six years ago. Uh, They've been working on it ever since. They got together. Um, Ian has more of a technical design background, so he helped with that, and Dennis was the evangelist on bringing, hey, there's uh, another way, a simple and easy way to control hemorrhage. So they've been at it ever since then. You know, we've obviously gone through design modifications. Uh, we're on our um, second um, version of the IT clamp. You know, it's easier to use, safer to use. It just, you know, looks nicer. But uh, it works the same way, just sealing the skin edges, causing direct pressure underneath the stuff to bleed. And it's but, still, it um, still kind of looks like a hair clamp too, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty... it still looks like yes, it does. It does. <laughs> that's a that's pretty cool uh, little innovation story there. I wonder that's such a great aha moment. He's looking at the hair clip and and uh, sees a sort of a new medical technology breakthrough. Um, yes, yeah, that's what you know. Everybody when they see a great new technology. Why didn't I think of that? Well, he actually did think of it. So, uh, yeah. you know, obviously a great inspirational moment brings forth a, a nice device. Yeah. It's the beauty is in its sort of elegance and simplicity. Um, yes. So uh, tell me about your background. Where you, where did you come from? You said you, you used to work. Yeah. That's what Boston kind Navy. of drew me to the company. Initially I was in the Navy. I served, uh, I was in desert storm, didn't see any combat or anything, but I have several friends that are still in the military and I've seen what they've gone through over the last uh, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a good friend of mine is a Marine general now, but eight deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan, desert storm, Somalia, he's been to all of them. And, you know, conversations, he said, each time he comes home, he goes to visit the families of the men who have served under him, who have died. And he visits, you know, all the, uh, injured as well. And, you know, if this device helps prevent one of those visits from anybody, prevents a death, and it can and has prevented death, then, uh, you know, it got me excited. Mm -hmm. Um, That's why I initially was interested. It's application, not only in the civilian, but obviously the military with my previous history. And after the military, I worked for a medical device company, laparoscopic instrumentation called Snowden Pencer, Worked there for a while, and we were sold to Genzyme, and I worked at Genzyme for uh, a total of 17 years, and uh, was the ran the sales organization for Seprofilm, which is a uh, bioresorbable membrane used to prevent adhesion prevention. So, uh, great run with a company that started when I started there as a uh, $600 million company, and by the time we were acquired, it was a $6 billion company. So mm-hmm. uh, it was a, a, a nice run and a lot of great leaders there to learn from and um, fun place to be. So when did you come on board at uh, at ITC? Or- sure. So I left Genzyme in uh, the fall of 2011. I started my own consulting business, working with first-line sales managers. I think everybody knows the story. You promote a lot of great sales reps and say, go get them, and don't give them a lot of training for a very different uh, skill set job. Right. Uh, I did that for a while, and then I worked for KCI, which is now Acelity, and I started sure. with Innovative Trauma 18 months ago. Mm-hmm. So I've been here about a year and a half. Okay. What was your mandate when you took over? Yeah, my mandate when I took over was mostly on the commercial side. We had a, a commercially available device. We were coming out with, uh, like I talked about, a version two, but that was still a year away. So it was just really work on the commercial aspects of the company and uh, continue to drive it forward into the marketplace. Mm -hmm. 
So, I mean, these are even in so different size of the medical device industry. This is a very different sales call point, right? I mean, this is, uh, I would imagine you're selling this to paramedics, uh, into the military. Um, uh, this is, is this also a, some hospitals, right? But this is a this is m- yes. mainly a emergent care product. What what's the unique? Uh, how would you describe the market in terms of how it relates to some of the other spaces you've worked in? Yeah, it's a very different market. Um, you know, there's roughly a million certified or credentialed EMTs and paramedics in the country. So it's a very uh, diverse and diffuse call point. Um, And it's from a commercial aspect, you know, we discovered it's not really the salesperson out there making the call that works in this. It's more the education, the educator, the the EMT or paramedic, you know, talking to his peers about using it themselves. And we really look to change protocols, and that's a long-term process. Right. But once a protocol is changed, then it becomes adopted and more widely used. And we've had success in markets where uh, medical directors have been kind of forward thinkers and seen the uh, ease of use, how quick it can be, and uh, the effect and effectiveness it can have in helping that patient bleed less or stop bleeding before they get to the emergency room. We do also have use in the emergency room. Uh, and then the military as well. So those are kind of three phases, pre-hospital trauma, ERs, and then the military as well. So uh, is it a disposable product or is it a, uh, can you reuse it? It is a single use product. Right, okay. So let's, let's just drill right back into the how to's of it again, just to make sure that we have that pretty clear. So the device looks like a clamp. It clamps on the two sides of the wound with needles small needles that are equally uh, set apart so they all puncture at once. And then it creates uh, a hematoma right under the skin. I I don't want to sort of get out over my skis on the clinical stuff here, but maybe you could give me a a broad view, a thousand foot view of how that sort of works. Well, you're correct. So it's a single use product, comes sterilely packed, just a little Tyvek lid you pull back, pop out the device. Um, you just press it to open all the way and you center it over the wound and press to close. Um, and the device does have eight suture needles in it. It looks a little bit, uh, scary when you look at it. I've used it on myself, obviously not, not because I had hemorrhage, but just, uh, needed to experience it. And I've shown numerous customers. You feel one needle going, so it kind of feels like an IV. Mm -hmm. If you're bleeding, I think, uh, you'd rather have that feel than continue to bleed. So, um, and it has eight suture needles and two pressure bars and the needles and the pressure bars hold it in place and keep the skin approximating. You're exactly right. A hematoma forms underneath and the back pressure stops the bleeding. Hmm. Um, yeah, so it's pretty simple. Um, and uh, even folks in the military, you know, who've used it and trained say, you know, you put it on and then you kind of want to watch it. But uh, until they get used to it and realize, okay, you put it on and move on to uh, continue to assess the patient. So it's especially useful when a patient has many different uh, issues going on at the same time. And obviously uh, stopping the hemorrhage is critical. So they'll use this and then they can continue to assess the patient very quickly. That's what the feedback we received from folks, especially in the military. So, it, but it doesn't create a, it doesn't actually suture the wound, right? It just kind of keeps it together, stops the bleeding. And then when they're in the, uh, the surgeon's care, they can take that off and then uh, operate on it. Right. You're exactly right. It's okay. temporary closure. It's not permanent. So it's used, it's approved for up to 24 hours. You don't really see it used past six hours because people get to a hospital pretty quickly. Yeah. And then uh, they'll perform definitive care, whether it be suturing there or going to the OR and getting more in-depth um, more in-depth care. What are some of the other things that can go wrong if you're, uh, obviously, besides dying from blood loss, uh, are there other uh, problems short of that that can occur from not stopping the bleeding quick enough? Sure. Well, just not stopping the bleeding quick enough, you, you run the uh, challenge of uh, hypothermia, mm-hmm. coagulopathy, where your your blood can't clot on itself. So it starts uh, a quick descent, uh, and oftentimes, you know, people uh, say, "Well, we're within five minutes of the hospital," but as a uh, 
because we're all prospective patients. I think if we could stop the bleeding, you know, every second counts, every drop of blood counts. And yeah. we're seeing uh, that raised more and more in the paramedic and EMT space. Mm-hmm. So your your challenge has been commercialization of the, the challenge that has been set before you. You Give me an idea of how you feel that that challenge has been met or, or where you're at on that curve. Yeah, we're still in the process of uh, pushing different markets. So we've uh, Atlanta Fire carries it on their vehicles. We have Memphis who's using it. Uh, like I said, we're head, where we were founded out of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and the whole province is uh, – uh, rolling it out right right now, the uh, Alberta Health System is starting mm-hmm. to use it. We have different uh, usages as well in different areas of the country, but it's hard to get protocol change, and that's one thing that's very different. So that's what we're working. Also, military adoption. Uh, you know, we have different units using it, especially at the special forces level. But to get widespread military adoption, it takes uh, longer, and we're really working on that uh, to try and get enough utilizations in the military where they uh, adopt it and endorse it. So we're working on those aspects now. And I'm sure as most people tell you, it's never as quick as you think or you plan, but uh, you know, we're just uh, keep, you know, continuing to drive forward, driving, you know, revenue driving, you know, trying to collect as much um, uh, as many case studies as we can to show the effectiveness of the product. And, you know, there are different publications that we're coming out with, different publications customers are coming out with on uh, utilization and success. So the good thing is the people that have it and have used it really like it, you know, believe in it and continue to use it. So that's a nice way to track the um, adoption and commercial viability of the product. And who are the standard bearers? Who sets these protocols? There's, well, the military has a committee called the Committee on Technical Combat Casualty Care, mm-hmm. and they set a, uh, they endorse it for the military, and many other organizations uh, follow what the U.S. military does. Based on the pre-hospital trauma environment over the last 15 years in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the U.S. military is considered an expert, obviously, on pre-hospital trauma. Right. So what they endorse often trickles down, not just in the U.S. on the civilian side, but also around the world. So mm-hmm. that's a, a big push for us is working with the military to um, get an endorsement from them. And that takes a lot of time and, yeah. uh, you know, work. And we're getting closer and closer. And it's been a, a great learning experience for us, even with a military background. It's uh it's been um, great to work with the military, and obviously, if someone needs this product, we want to make sure they have access to it. And once the TCCC um, will change guidelines, that affects a couple big organizations in the U.S. that um, uh, the pre-hospital trauma life support, international trauma life support, oftentimes will uh, adopt the protocol of the U.S. military. So then, it. Uh, that changes kind of national protocol. And then we have a uh, local protocol that's often uh, done by a medical director who's in charge of a, an area or a city. And we try and work with the medical directors to get them to, uh, you know, see the utilization of the product and change local protocols. And then there's state protocols as well. Yeah. Is it is selling it to the military analogous to selling it to a large hospital system or is it much, much harder or easier? Uh, I would say it's harder. Uh, you know, they both take longer than you project and expect. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, and, and luckily the operational tempo of the military, although it's still pretty high, I don't want to take anything from that. It's not as high as it had been in the past. So, um, you know, I think uh, when times are at a very high tempo, they're, you products get approved a little bit quicker and this will take or endorse a little bit quicker and this is taking a little more time and you know like i said we're just uh, getting in the hands of as many uh, deploying units as we can and uh, hopefully they don't need any hemorrhage control but if they do we want them to have the option to use this and provide feedback on you know was it effective where did you use it did it control bleeding did you use it with packing you know just different things so we can continue to learn and uh, if we have to change the advice to make it better, we'll do that. But uh, we believe it's in a pretty good place now. And the feedback we received so far from 
military usage and civilian usage has been uh, very good. We've over 200 case studies completed. So, in the in the paramedic world, I mean, that's the the paramedics, at EMTs. They work for the actual hospital. I mean, the uh, ambulance companies, or do they work for the hospital care systems? And it's actually a world I don't know much about. Yeah, and it's uh, it's a world that there's so many different ambulance companies. The biggest company is uh, AMR, American Medical Response, and I believe they just recently acquired the second biggest, which is Rural Metro. Uh, so there's one massive ambulance company, and then there's a lot of smaller ones, and it varies on what area you're in. Uh, sometimes they're affiliated with a hospital, and oftentimes they're private. So it's... Uh, it just, uh, again, varies greatly on where you are and uh, what the setup is in that area. Right. So it's interesting. Here you have this product that is incredibly, that works very well, that it fits into a really nice little white space there. Uh, but the market is very, seems to be very challenging and unique. Um, how, how have you sort of managed that? Um, internally and, and manage investors and manage expectations. How do you how do you feel that that has gone? Yeah, and with the investor, our investors have been fantastic in the board and the employees. It's just you know we just communicate as often as possible. And mm -hmm. our thing is you know our you know we do sell it uh, on the local level, but there are also opportunities for bigger revenue opportunities like the military. There's different countries we're working in. Uh, you know, different hotspots in the world that are looking at it right. uh, as well. So it's, you know, it's balancing those day-to-day -day uses on a local level on the larger scale opportunities and just keeping the investors and the board and the employees as uh, appraised as possible on what's going on. And, you know, in the local level, it continues to, you know, grow and do well. And then on the larger scale, it's, you know, it takes a lot of time and you don't know until, you get the PO. So it's a little uh, challenging from that perspective. You know, you have the, you know, you're trying to balance the, the local and the global view of the product. So you have other militaries beyond the U S military that are currently using this. Uh, we do. Okay. We do have uh, some of the ones in the uh, areas of the world that are a little hotter right now. And uh, many others are looking at it. And, uh, you know, a lot of them will take their cue from the U.S. military. Right. So, can, I mean, can you say which ones, or is that uh, private information? Yeah, I'd rather not say right now okay. until they make the announcement. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's interesting, though. I mean, you have those other opportunities. Um, it seems like a very unique situation. I, 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 and how many salespeople do you have, or, or is this more of a CEO to CEO sale? Yeah, it's, we don't have, we have, uh, what we do is we have clinical trainers we employ that are contracted with us. Again, the, uh, you know, if someone wants to use it, um, we'd rather being trained by their peers than we would by a sales rep who's not a paramedic or an EMT. So we'd rather, you know, a firefighter be trained by another firefighter, EMT or police or SWAT. Some SWAT units are starting to pick this up for tactical now. Um, so it's not, um, you know, I come from a sales background, so this is very different for me, but uh, it's not really the sales rep pushing it. It's more on the clinical level, uh, dealing with the different medical directors and then uh, the clinical educators more on the street level as well. Hmm. And on the military side, we have sponsors that are um, in the, uh, senior enlisted medics, and we also have trauma surgeons that have, uh, you know, kind of carry the product forward. You know, they look at the evidence and, make a determination whether they want to sponsor it and back it or not. And we have some, you know, very high visibility people that have looked at the product, used it themselves and said, okay, we, we can get behind this and the military needs a product like this. What would you say is the um, overwhelming thing that puts them over the top when they use it that says, yeah, we got to have this? Is it it's the when they use it and they have a tough to control hemorrhage yeah. and they use it and we also have had some labs where people have come in uh, and people are skeptical and that's the way you know it should be if you're a healthcare provider you know skepticism is a good thing right so once they see it used either in a lab or uh, on a you know on a real hemorrhage 
uh, that's when it's kind of the aha moment. You know, it's yeah. like a lot of things, no matter how big your clinical studies are, until they have that end of one, that personal experience, that's what really mm-hmm. uh, ingrains in them, hey, this, this, you're, you know, you're right, it was easy to use, it was quick, and it worked. Yeah. And l- like all products, no product works on everybody or everything. So, uh, but the feedback we received has been very, very positive. So about how big is your team now and uh, what has the funding picture been like for you? I mean, I know you're commercialized, but I, 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 you st- I, I believe you still have some room to go until you're in the, in the black, right? We do. We do. So, um, uh, as we work closer to getting military endorsement, once we get that, uh, or reach a certain milestone on the commercial side, we'll start our C round okay. and, uh, you know, like everyone, we believe that will be our last round, but we'll reach a level of commercialization, getting closer to, uh, you know, funding ourselves and driving forward. So, um, you know, it's been, uh, this is the first time I've raised money. I mean, I think everyone raises money inside a company because you're always competing for dollars. Mm-hmm. So this is just, uh, you know, meeting with investors and everyone gets what's going on in the world. Things have changed. You know, we talk about Boston, with Paris, you have what just happened in Brussels. Uh, all the school shootings, people see the need for hemorrhage control. And yeah. uh, oftentimes it's the, the first responders aren't trained. It's the civilians and there's no better uh, picture of that than what happened in Boston. You know, yeah. Those pictures are ingrained in everyone's mind. Uh, and so, you know, to have an easy to use product available for people. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of that goes with training because the tourniquet's not as easy as it seems. It's not right. just tightening a belt around someone's leg. I mean, that will help. Yeah. But it's not going to occlude blood flow completely. I mean, do you so. see it as being sort of analogous to uh, defibrillator pads and how no, that, now you see those in public places and gyms and things like that? Do you actually see a scenario whereby uh, facilities might have these on, on site? And, and stock them for yeah. the unlikely event that something happens? or there, ha- there has been a lot of talk about having hemorrhage control kits stationed similar to uh, AEDs. Yeah, like Very schools, similar. Right? Be- I mean, yeah. yeah, school. any place where I think the number is where, where 50 people congregate, so churches, schools, places of business, yeah. with movie theaters, you know, just any- anywhere like that. And then, you know, it has to be accessible. People have to know it's there, and people have to know how to use the products in there. So it has to be, uh, you know, if someone opens it, we want them to know how to use our device and where to use it. And that takes a little bit of training. That's hard to do to the mass population. Yeah. So, um, but there has been talk, not just by our company, by many companies, that government has a stop the bleed campaign because um, hemorrhage control is so important. And there's the Hartford consensus, which is a, a group that's, uh, you know, for active shooter scenarios, the first thing is shooter suppression. You know, you want to stop the threat. And number two is hemorrhage control. Yeah. So people recognize the, the need for it. And it's unfortunate that's the world we live in now. But, uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah. It's, it's it's actually just kind of shocking to even think about that. But it is true. It's the world we live in. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about uh, assumptions you may have had coming in to this position um, that turned out to be either uh, sort of wrong or off or, or uh, completely right on. If you could share any with us, uh, sort of lessons you might have learned dur- um, during your tenure here. Yeah. So, you know, I think uh, coming in, you know, being a sales guy, I thought, you know, this would be easy to uh, appeal to the mass market of EMTs and paramedics. But, uh, you know, learning there's a different process of adoption with pre-hospital. And, uh, you know, it was a a learning curve for me. And, um, you know, but the one thing that hasn't changed is there's the need for the device and the device works. And that's what keeps us going. It keeps investors involved and keeps us driving forward. So, um, you know, there's always going to be need for hemorrhage control. And until a better product comes along, I think there's obviously a very viable market for us. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you'd think that a product that works would be easy to sell. <laughs> but I guess the lesson we learn every day in medicine is that that's that not always true, right? I mean, yeah, there's a lot of great products that, uh, you know, don't 
don't make it. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, if you go in an OR, you see a lot of products that were felt to be important that sit against the wall for a long time. So, um, you know, it's, you know, that's the last thing we want is someone to buy this product and not use it when it's applicable. Yeah. So, you know, I know education is when product adoption, it's not just the initial, it's going back three months later, another three months to, Hey, have you used it? Have you experienced it? Here's where other people have used it. Here's the success they've had. Here's the challenges. Here's where it's worked. Here's where it hasn't, you know, it's just that ongoing clinical and education dialogue because, you know, if an EMT has been in the field for 15 years are so used to treating a wound one way. So conceptually they may get it, but what's going to make them reach for this device mm-hmm. or any other new device. So it's just that, you know, it's, it's not the one, um, the one the initial in service. It takes a lot of time for adoption, but as word spreads and people get used to it, you know, same thing happens anywhere, right? If someone yeah. likes something, um, it starts to spread and other people, uh, start to utilize. How about assumptions? How about assumptions? This is the first time you said he raised funding. Any assumptions that you had going into the fundraising world that uh, have proven to be different than you initially thought, or, or easier, more difficult? Any lessons that you could share from that? You know, it's been um, uh, it's been educational from the standpoint of you know just looking at things from their perspective, how quickly they want the money back, what kind of return they're looking for. Um, you know, I know it takes patience to launch a device. Investors, rightly so, don't have a, you know, they don't want to wait that long. So, a medical device, I think it's you know, um, it's been more of a challenge for people to raise money. But uh, for a good product with a good market, there's definitely going to be money there. It's just, you know, getting in front of the right people and making sure they believe not only in the product, but your plan to uh, drive adoption. Right. So the, <clears throat> the FDA clearance, that must have come, was that prior to your um, yes. tenure there? Yeah, they already had a commercially uh, used product. Okay. So I didn't have to go through the 510K process with the company. I've mm-hmm. been for... Um, you know, uh, when we brought the new device forward, the approval came uh, right when I started. And then in terms of payment, is it uh, is it a cash pay thing or is it there is there reimbursement for this? There is no reimbursement. Okay. okay. So, I mean, that has its own advantages and disadvantages too, though. Um, so in, yes. ter- in terms of marketing the product and things like that. So. Uh, has that been kind of a wash in, in, in some respects? Like it's, I, I think they're used to it because products that they use in ambulance, you know, they'll get a uh, reimbursement. It's not a line item reimbursed for products, yeah. so it's pretty standard. And same in the ER, you know, people don't ask, don't even ask us about reimbursement. Yeah. Who, I mean, who who owns the market on tourniquets? I mean, I think of tourniquets, I think of, like what you said, putting a belt on somebody or uh, ripping a fabric off and tying it off. Obviously, that's sort yeah. of dramatized and simplistic, but is there, a, is there actually a, 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 a dominant player in the tourniquet market? You, you, when you look at a dominant player, you have to look at who is the military business, and there's a thing called the cat tourniquet now. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's roughly four or five tourniquets on the market that you see uh, fairly frequently. Um, and people are trying to come up with you know easier to apply tourniquets, more effective tourniquets. And yeah. tourniquets are extremely painful when they're applied correctly. Yeah. Um, so, you know, how do you try and limit that pain is another challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, so there's a number of different players on the market, and you know, they all have different things that give them advantages. And so uh, it's an interesting market to watch as well. In terms of the trajectory of the company, is there a, a, a what's the business plan say? Is it to, to build this company to a certain point and then partner up with a larger medical technology company? Or um, is there an IPO in your business plan future? Uh, what do, I mean, I, I guess the standard answer is always we're going to build the best company that we can and see what happens. But do you, maybe you have another answer. Yeah. That. No, I think, you know, that was the marching orders I was given from the board is build things the right way. So you have options. You know, you can, you can 
sell it. You can, uh, you know, work with another company on a distribution side. You can IPO. You could add other products. Um, you can do a lot of different things. So the main thing was build it the right way. Now, most of the time when you're backed by venture capital, they're looking to sell it at a certain point. So that's the most likely, but I was not say, hey, in two years, this company is going up for sale. They're like, do things the right way. So we yeah. have different options. I'm, I'm trying to figure out like what kind of company would be a match. Would it be a wound care company or would it be a trauma company? So there's a few companies that do the pre-hospital uh, sales. If you think of um, a company like a Teleflex, they have a pre-hospital sales force. You think a striker that sells the, the stretchers to the ambulance companies. You yeah. also other other companies get involved. There's other companies, you know, with wound care products. So, mm -hmm. uh, and then does any larger company ever get into, you know, kind of uh, take control of the space or be the dominant player in the space? Because there's no one large company that has you know a 300 person commercial team out there selling a product. Wow. So there's, uh, yeah, different opportunities, but, uh, you know, companies keep tabs on us like all companies and, sure. you know, they, they want to just, uh, continue to track it. And, you know, it's a pretty intriguing device because it's pretty simple and it's easy to use, but it's different than what they're doing now. Yeah, it is. It's, it's pretty fascinating. And, and I've watched some of those product videos and one of them did have a, uh, sort of a graphic content warning on it. And, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind the of one video. Yeah, yeah. It lived up to it a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's pretty incredible. It's a thermal uh, it's artery a, dissection. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing to, to watch. Um, but I'm a little squeamish around the blood stuff. So it was, um, yeah, it's not a good one to watch if you're squeamish. No. <laughs> but, but it, you know, if you, if you think about, it, you know, one of the most common injuries is a scalp laceration. And uh, basically, you'll just see someone with a turban wrapped on there. And yeah. There's one emergency room doctor told me, he goes, that just wicks the blood out of the wound. You know, it's really hard to compress uh, a scalp. So our number one use is scalps um, yeah. because it does bring the skin edges together and forces that pressure. So uh -huh. it's uh, very effective. Yeah, yeah that, that's interesting. Um, anything I didn't ask you wanted to add? Yeah, well, one exciting thing is we're up for the Medical Design Excellence Award, uh, and I think it's the May-June time frame we'll find out, and right. that's uh, in conjunction with the company that really designed. So our first version product was effective, yet it wasn't uh, the most uh, cosmetically appealing. Um, we heard the term barbaric a few times, <laughs> uh, and our, uh, our version two device is, uh, like I said, it's easier to use. It's easier to take off, which is critical. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, you know, works very well, you know, uh, equivalent to our version one device. And that was NPR associates, uh, designed. It was great working with them. I came in in the middle of the design and it was, uh, uh, great to work with a firm of that caliber and, you know, the just the keeping us up to date on everything. They got behind the product. They're a believer in the product. It's nice that they just didn't design it and walk away. They've stayed yeah. engaged with us and helped us each step of the way. So uh, we're excited to see how that uh, – I know we're one of the final six. Mm -hmm. So uh, looking forward to um, hearing the results. So when did you bring that? The, when did you bring the product to NPR? Just – Maybe we could just dig in that real quick. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know when it first started with NPR. I believe it was a basically a year long project mm -hmm. um, or more. It was actually longer than a year. So I would say it's about an 18 month project from starting to work with NPR till a commercial launch. Right. Uh, and that's not all in the design and uh, some of it was manufacturing. And they worked obviously very well with our manufacturer and were manufactured by MedBio and Grand Rapids. They've been an excellent firm to work with as well. Sure, yeah. So, you know, design manufacturing, again, more of a commercial background for me. So it was very educational and to see the steps that go through and just the, uh, the detail, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. It was inspiring to see both of those teams work on this. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a, you know, a terrific partnership. And, of course, we love NPR Associates. They're one of our um, supporters and underwriters, and we uh, have, do have to say that. But, uh, dude, they are a terrific group. Um, well, thank you so much. I really, uh, Joe, I really had a good time hearing about the company and the product and, uh, I wish you the best of luck. It seems like something that we really need out there. And, uh, um, I, I hope to cover many more successes, uh, from you guys.
Thank you very much, Brian. I appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great day.